For over 20 years, Duggan McDonnell has been making his mark on the West Coast beverage scene, distinguishing himself at such San Francisco gems as the Redwood Room and Absinthe. He is the founder and owner of Cantina and has designed cocktails for the Sundance Film Festival, Aspen Food and Wine, the Omni Hotel, and many others. He is also a winemaker and distiller and lectures at the Culinary Institute of America. Passionate about writing as well as mixology, he has authored articles and recently published his first book. Drinking the Devil's Acre, a love letter from San Francisco and her cocktails, is at once a bold primer on modern mixology, a barman's memoir, and a dive into San Francisco's rich cocktail history. Please join me in welcoming Duggan McDonald. Thank you, Marin. Marin told me that she was a really great Google stalker. And um, wonderful bio, thank you. What's that? I'm looking off, where are you? <laughs> uh, how many folks in, in this room like to drink? Cocktails, yeah? Your event show, two hands perhaps that. How many of you in this room uh, think that you perhaps have a good palate? Or at least an inquisitive one? You like to go out, you like to learn, you like to taste new things, okay. I'm that guy as well. Uh, I found at a very early age, I was sharing with Marin earlier, uh, that two decades ago, uh, during my first summer abroad, which was when I was 18, uh, I spent it between high school and summer in Europe. You can drink legally there. And I learned a lot about myself that summer. And one of the things that I learned uh, is that I was most concerned about flavor and texture, and not just the buzz that I was getting uh, from that pint of Guinness. And it led me down a path, uh, or shall we say a rabbit hole, uh, which I'm in uh, these two decades later. This book uh, that's right here, Drinking the Devil's Acre, um, is many things. Uh, in addition to narrative, uh, memoir, and history, uh, it's also part cultural anthropology. And one of the things that I was most interested in is studying this community, thinking about San Francisco as the epicenter of the Bay Area, of the culture of Northern California, and how the culture of California has historically been connected to cocktails, and what I learned was that it was also historically connected to how we taste, okay? Uh, in this book, I make an assertion that we actually learned to taste first and our palates became developed first via the cocktail, all right? Uh, so again, I'm Duggan McDonald, and uh, a few months ago, this book, Drinking the Devil's Acre, was published. It's history, it's memoir, and it tells all of these years of my time shaking and then drinking uh, behind the stick as well. What I'm most passionate about, as I said, is how San Franciscans drank and came to understand flavor. And what I'd love to hear from you today is whether you agree with me and whether you've also experienced this. The, talk, uh, the title of this talk is Bright, Bitter, and Boozy. Perhaps some of you in this room can relate to at least uh, one of those three adjectives. Whether you're native to the Bay Area or a recent immigrant who happens to chug many a cocktail, I believe that's what we all are. So here in Northern California, I'm here to tell you that your culture, our culture, first experienced flavor via cocktails. Our palates found enlightenment by sipping, not chewing. Again, the culture of the Bay Area first acquired its understanding and its passion for flavor through the cocktail glass, not via fork and plate. I'm going to read just a few lines from this book so that you understand. San Francisco began as a city of drink. And from its infancy, discerning and decisive San Franciscans tippled by calling out the name of their drink. The city did not begin with that ribald Barbary coast, nor was it the Arizona or the Colorado of the Wild West where thirsty pioneers dumbly hollered, whiskey. No, no, no. This was the San Francisco of the gold rush, the Comstock Lode, a city shaped by the big four and other robber barons. The prevailing culture spoke civilly to, rather than shouted at, the barkeep. Whiskey smash, if you please. Sherry Cobbler. If you don't mind, claret and lemonade if it's no trouble. It wasn't a culture that barked for straight hooch. Instead, the tune sung throughout was of freshly squeezed citrus, sprigs of peppermint, dashes of bitters here and there. 
So come along with me and think. Cocktails offer an explosion of flavor. They are liquid combinations of wine and spirit, liqueur, fresh produce, dashes of bitters, tinctures, and most of these ingredients are shelf stable. They can travel across the world in the hull of a ship, ready to be blended by the ounce behind the bar when they are finally chosen by their destined barkeep. Let's remember this old cocktail called the Martinez. An Abrahamic cocktail, the forerunner to the martini, it tastes of clove, juniper, cinnamon, orange peel, tart cherry, mm, vanilla, sassafras, bitter orange, cardamom. Rare is that rare steak that could offer such an abundance of flavor, but this cocktail can. San Francisco, because it has been bright, bitter, and boozy, from its first week as a city known round the world in 1849, has had at the core of its identity this burst of flavor. The fastest growing, richest city in the history of the world got to drink what it wanted to drink. And then San Francisco got spoiled. We got used to good drink. Does that sound familiar, folks? The richest city in the history of the world? What is this Bay Area now? We have a few bucks going around, don't we? And isn't there a cocktail renaissance that's been happening as well, simultaneously? It's an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? 150-ish years ago, San Francisco had a lot of options, principally a large menu from which to drink. Then, as now, the city was a port city, and it was the port that fed the city in ideas, in human populations, and in drink. Into this port came the largest most diverse stream of champagne, port, Jamaican rum, Scotch whiskey, Dutch gin, Bordeaux, Pisco from Peru, just to name a few. Never before had such a collection of wine and spirits ever been on offer. Never before had a city sprung up, seemingly overnight, from mountains of harvested gold. And again, it was because of all that gold that great disposable income that San Francisco commanded the world's finest drink. Does that sound like some of the back bars that you go and see in the city today? Where there's 400 bottles lining the shelves and the barkeep gets to play with all of these different flavors? That was happening in the 1850s. And so imagine that old barkeep. Let's think, huh? Mustache, oil cloth, Okay? You're just here, perhaps it's your first job, and you're standing in front of all of the splendor, and you think, what am I going to do with all this stuff? Huh? What would you do? You'd start mixing, wouldn't you? I think I'd feel at home, uh, and I would, I would have started mixing, just as I have done recently. You see, from its birth, again, San Francisco has been a city of innovation. And drinking the devil's acre reveals that much of that early innovation actually happened in the saloon. The great spirits of the world captivated the imagination of the first generation of mixologists, and to work they went. And for that, I'm quite thankful. By the time 1881 arrived and California's first cookbooks, first cookbook was finally published, no less than the world's first four cocktail books had come from the city's finest barkeeps. Newspapers were full of advertisements for apothecaries for homemade bitters. And I should share with you, the first piece of fiction ever published in California was called Punch Drinking and Its Effects. First piece of fiction published in our state was about a cocktail. The local landscape was lousy with breweries, lousy with local distilleries, then came the wineries, and then finally, into full bloom, came the drinking culture of Northern California. The most prolific and the greatest contributor of intellectual property to drink, the world will ever know. This is something that I'm proud of. This is something, frankly, that makes our lives a lot more delicious. Close your eyes with me. The gold rush, the Comstock load, the whaling years, railroad barons, the Martinez, the whiskey smash, the gin fizz, punches, sours, and flips. IBM, 
Apple, YouTube, the Mai Tai, the Lemon Drop, Pisco Punch, Friendster, Facebook, the Chartreuse Swizzle, the Basil Gimlet, Google, and the Irish Coffee. All of these local innovations. The greatest diversity of liquid decadence the world has ever known. And together, money and cocktails shall ever flow. Now let's return to why San Francisco learned specifically about flavor from drink. Produce is perishable, yes? Requiring preservation for travel. Not so a barrel of rum or a bottle of sherry. Meats and vegetables today benefit from refrigerated boxcars, trucks perfectly chilled, uh, much of it frozen, right, while traveling America's highways. Now, California cuisine could not and did not develop to anything like it is today until long after electric generators were developed, mass produced, until highways were chock full with trucks traveling from farm to city every single day. It's a very recent phenomenon. Our palates were first informed by drink. And in California, it is a bright, bitter, and boozy palate we have. So what do I mean by bright? Does it have an IQ? <laughs> uh, is it merely something, say, citric? A little fresh lemon in your water? Or in your martini? It can be. As citrus was first cultivated in the United States by the Spanish fathers here in early California, but without balance, uh, a little sugar, citric really just means acidic, which can be too tart, which can be, frankly, yuck, all right? So I mean that cocktails in Northern California are abundant with citrus, whether for its juice to be squeezed or for essential oils found in the skins of lemons and oranges to be expressed uh, over into Negronis, old fashions. And I do not mean citrus come from Florida. What do I mean? Local satsumas, local Meyer lemons, because that is what prevails here. Because when produce is fresh, the height of its flavor experience is in fact higher. By bright, I also mean herbaceous. What was the name? of the little Spanish town at the end of the mythic peninsula before it became known as San Francisco. Does anybody know? Yerba Buena. Yerba Buena, says the gentleman in row two. Right, and that means good herb, as it was called by the Spanish for all the plentiful wild mint that was grown all over the land. Trader Vic, that native San Franciscan who created the Mai Tai, the scorpion bowl, amongst many other wildly imaginative offerings, his favorite garnish of choice was a mint sprig. Smacking it, something bright, something to sort of heighten that aromatic experience of cocktails. And in the mid-90s, long before the mojito craze swept the country, that lovely highball, bright with fresh mint, was alive and well in San Francisco. Let's talk about bitterness. Has anyone ever experienced bitterness in a cocktail? Hmm? Sure, sure, sure. Well, San Francisco has long been bitter, but it's actually been a preference uh, of ours. I mentioned that in the Gold Rush era, dozens of brands of local bitters were being produced. They were consumed for health, folk medicine, if you will. And the ingredients used were this amazing combination of local produce, along with exotic roots and spices freshly imported from the Andes or from Canton, China. And as bitters became ubiquitous, so too did these San Fran-centric combinations of bitter global flavor. Fast forward to World War I, okay? Northern Italy becomes a front in a vicious fight. Trench warfare ensues, and the entire region is destabilized. Within the next decade, tens of thousands of immigrants from Northern California came to San Francisco and settled in the North Beach region. With them, they brought 
their two local preferred Amaros. What are the names of those brands? Campari, Fernet Branca, okay? If you've ever wondered how San Francisco acquired its passion for the Negroni cocktail or for chugging shots of Fernet, not only does it go back to North Beach and that northern Italian migration during the 20s, which was prohibition, remember, but also before that. Uh, this, this region has preferred something bitter on the palate for nearly 150 years. Let's talk about being boozy, shall we? Many of you asked if I brought my samples with me today. I'm sorry I did not. In the old days, the port of San Francisco and today, the port of Oakland, receives more coffee beans than any other port in the world. Does anyone know that? Why am I talking about coffee? Stay tuned. Long ago, it was Hills Brothers, which was located on the waterfront, that dominated the national coffee landscape. Today, a few different companies. But locally, we have artisanal brands. Blue Bottle, Equator. But now let's remember, the most widely known coffee drink all over the world, which comes from San Francisco, has what in it? A slug of whiskey. The Irish coffee, folks. One of the drinks that San Francisco is most famed for, uh, its most famous coffee drink, actually has booze in it, and quite a bit of it. Has anyone here been to the Buena Vista? Full house, perfect. <laughs> uh, I'm a local and I go often. Northern California with its breweries, wineries, and distilleries produces the largest amount of alcohol in the country. That should come as no surprise. California as a state also imports and consumes the largest amount of alcohol in the nation. It is boozy to its core. And so I wonder, folks, with all this alcohol, these experiences of bright, of bitter, and boozy, I wonder if we think better. I wonder if we perform better. I wonder if we work harder because of that delicious, abundant reward of great drink all around us. I think that there's a connection. I wonder how intrinsically linked cocktails just might be to the world's great culinary region, to the center of innovation. I'll leave you with a quote from Doris Muscatine's epic book, Old San Francisco, which I quote in my book, and it's one of my favorites, and I think it describes San Francisco then and now perfectly. She says, drinking was such a fact of city life that it was certainly considered no disgrace to frequent a saloon, which the entire populace did without embarrassment. Since everybody acknowledged that everybody drank, large-scale social drinking became taken for granted, and there was consequently little stigma attached. San Francisco has never lost its enthusiasm for alcohol. Thank you for your time. And now I'd like to hear from you what your thoughts are on being bright, bitter, and boozy, some of your favorite watering holes, cocktails uh, to make or shake. Go ahead. Going to boozy and bitter, yeah. uh, isn't it true that Anchor Brewery sort of invented the modern IPA? Uh, I would say that would be our fine friends up in Chico. In Chico. Sierra Nevada. Okay. Well, one of the things that Anchor did was revive the rye whiskey uh, revolution. Uh, I have the year in the book, but I think it was perhaps it was 97 or 99. Uh, and Anchor became the first and only distillery in the United States to, to make 100% rye whiskey. And uh, that wasn't happening anywhere. Well, here we are. Again, San Francisco, long ahead of the curve. And we're in the midst of not only a whiskey revolution right now, but a rye revolution. The Old Fashioned uh, is one of the most popular uh, cocktails in the country. Whiskey has outpaced vodka in recent sales. And it all goes back, I think, to the late 90s when Fritz Maytag, uh, the previous owner, said, 
I'm going to do this. It's time that America sort of take back uh, its rye whiskey heritage. And in fact, long before, say, there were vines uh, planted throughout Northern California, there's actually fields of rye. So it was a local thing. So the distilleries that were happening here in the 1860s and 70s produce a ton of, uh, of specifically rye whiskey. Uh, that was his inheritance. That's our inheritance, and I'm glad he did it. Thank you for touching on the connection between wealth and drinking. Mm -hmm. um, what is the best cocktail for coping with gentrification? Uh, that is the best question that I've been asked this fall on this book tour. Thank you for asking that. Um, something expensive, I think, is the, the right answer. Did everyone hear the question? The best cocktail to drink while coping with gentrification? Um, I'm going to steal that. Uh, yes, something expensive and something on someone else's tab, I think, is, is, the, is the right way to do it. Do you have a preference? Um, I had something, I think, last week or the week before, and um, it was over by Civic Center, and it was whiskey in a stout, along with nutmeg and cinnamon, and, and I just loved it. I had another. Hit you right there. Yeah. <laughs> so you had two. That's great. Um, did you pay for them? Good. What a good man. Well... <laughs> <laughs> you put it on a credit card, though. You'll, you'll deal with it at the end of the month. <laughs> All right. Sure, the, the question is, can I name a few local rye whiskey? So in addition to, to Anchor, uh, the folks over at St. George Spirits are getting into the whiskey business. Not just rye yet, but they're working on that. Uh, but there's a, there uh, is a distillery up in uh, Sonoma by the name of... Folks, what is it? Spirit Works? Yeah, they also make the slow gin. They have, they're just about to launch uh, a straight rye whiskey. And I tasted it last week. It's very nice. So very nice. Local, are they actual local distilleries? They are distilling their own So yeah, alcohol? they are what you would call part of the grain to glass movement. Where, 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 the question, where the question is coming from is that the great majority of, of whiskey in this country is actually made by very few people. Uh, there's a couple of distilleries in the middle of the country that everyone just buys from and then redistills or does their own thing. Or they say, hey, this is our recipe. You guys make it and give it to us, and then we'll finish it or we'll barrel it or something. Some part of that process is largely what's happening um, in the country. There are certain folks like Buffalo Trace, Wild Turkey. They do everything on their own. Uh, but you know, for instance, there's, there are brands that are largely outsourced. The local guys now are trying to be more part of you know, this California ethos, which is the grain to glass uh, movement. And I think we're gonna see more of that, not just here, but throughout the country. More of the? More of the grain to glass movement. Basically controlling the ingredients and all of the steps to you know, ensure quality, and also to be able to content, connect with your consumer to say, look, we made this and here's why, and you can answer every single question because your steps are vertically integrated. You know, you know, you know exactly how everything's been made. You also mentioned some herbs coming from the Andes, mm -hmm. for instance. What? Sure, well, coca leaves used to be legal. <laughs> uh, but quinine, you know, principally chinchona bark is the main one uh, that did and does still come from Peru. Uh, quinine is the principal ingredient in what? Anyone know? Tonic. Tonic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not just in tonic water, but before that it was in many different uh, formulas. You know, for bitters, and there's other things uh, coming from down there as well. Uh, so, and of course, San Francisco being on the Pacific, stuff would stop off in those ports down here, get loaded on, they do some commerce, come up here to the port of San Francisco, another layer of commerce, and then folks would take them to their pharmacies and have at it. So, what are your some of your favorite uh, San Francisco establishments for new and inventive cocktails these days? Okay. So this book, Drinking the Devil's Day, was organized according to 25 chapters, okay? 25 cocktails that are iconic and you know, celebrated in San Francisco, whether created there or sacred too. Within those 25 chapters, I provide some, some spots. Uh, one of them is, of course, the, the Irish coffee in, in the Buena Vista, right. so that's one. Um, Comstock Saloon is another. Uh, you've probably heard about Trick Dog and the Mission. It's getting a lot of ink. That's a great one. I was, a rec I was just recommending uh, Benjamin Cooper, which is a lovely little hidden gem uh, on a mid-level mezzanine in a hotel right off Union Square. Huh. Uh, 
no signage, no nothing, really great, just opened up. Um, White Chapel is the stunning new gin bar in the Tenderloin. You walk right in and you feel like you're in like a Terry Gilliam film. You know, <laughs> Brazil, 12 Monkeys, it's this wild uh, sort of pseudo London interior, White Chapel. Uh, I recommend it, yeah. Okay, hmm. mm -hmm. I'll try it out. Yeah, I also just recently discovered uh, Alembic. Of course, yeah, that's a staple. That's a staple. I think that opened up in 2006. Uh, same time as uh, my bar, Cantina, opened. They opened just a few months uh, before my place. So um, from the food side, I think generally people assume, or have talked about how American palates have become much sweeter, saltier. Um, how, have you, how do you think that our palates have evolved um, on, the, on the alcohol side? Mm -hmm. And are there any flavors you think that we've lost that we should rediscover? Mm, great question. Thank you for asking. So I think that here in California, we began with a bright, bitter, and boozy palate, and we lost it. And I think that we're actually in the, in, in the process of gaining it back. I think that the middle 20th century screwed us up. Um, on the food side, everything was available in a can, right? Or it was frozen or something like that. Um, and that became true not just in food by having you know, cans of beans and meats and vegetables, but also with cocktails, right? All of a sudden, you, everything came in a mix and it was some funny color so that like, the guys in space could just grab a bunch of bottles and go have a cocktail party. Um, they didn't know there was a farm anywhere. And that went on for decades. And recently, call it the Whole Foods movement or uh, some sort of farmer's market, farm to glass movement, if you will, we're starting to get this back. Um, anytime you put anything fresh in there, it's going to be brighter. But it's also going to sway. So uh, because that flavor is alive, right, and it's changing in your glass. So we're starting to see cocktails that you know, has to be made with precision, so we're getting better at our recipes, all right? Uh, because we have better access to ingredients now, and also, well, thank you, thankfully to the internet, we have uh, this access to information like we've never had before. It used to be you had to publish a book, you know? And people had to buy a book, you know, to get uh, great stories and great recipes. That's not true anymore. You can find a lot of information on the internet. And so, and so now, if you go to your BevMo and your Whole Foods and you have a, uh, a smartphone, you can make amazing cocktails. Uh, and that's the era that we're in. And so I think we're regaining that. Um, I, I think it's so wild that kale and arugula is popular. Uh, but then you might think that it's also wild that you know, homemade bitters and, and tinctures you know, from bell peppers and many other things are, are also just as popular. And I think all of that is informing our palate. So on the plate and in the glass, that's where we're at right now. And I think it's only going to continue uh, because of this access that we have. And I, I can't imagine going back into the dark ages of a couple decades ago. You know, I, I, grew, you know, I grew up thinking that most green beans came from a can. How about you? I grew up in California, so <laughs> not so much. I grew up in Santa Clara, OK? <laughs> you know, the next county down. And uh, you know, we had a garden. But a garden yields what? A couple of meals worth, you know? Most of the green beans had a jelly green giant on them. And there was commercials about him. He was my friend, you know? And, uh, and that was my experience with food. You know, and I think we're never going to go back there. I hope, at least. How, how do you start uh, creating, and like, what's your approach to creating a new cocktail? Hmm. So, the, how would I? Uh, how do I create new cocktails? Quite honestly, I have because I've been thinking about alcohol and flavor for over two decades. I have a big bank between the small space in my ears. Uh, it's all taken up with boozy flavors and ideas, and so. Even if I taste something new for the first time, I can then associate it with hundreds of other things. And the ideas mostly come quickly, and I don't even need to make them. I sort of know what it's going to taste like ahead of time, uh, because I do all the, the balance in my head. And I know the structures and all that. Um, I'm constantly doing development like that. And it's sort of like composing. I can create the theory in my head first, and then I can make it, yeah, that kind of stacks up to exactly how I thought, and I might adjust it by a quarter or a half ounce, one thing or the other, and it's done. Um, but again, that's only come from decades of drinking and thinking about drink. Uh, one of the things that I do, though, when I'm training, and one of the things that I make all of my staff do, and it's the second or third to last chapter in this book, is I talk about the most important tool behind any bar. 
Can anyone think about what that is? Is it a shaker? Is it a muddler? Anyone know? It's a straw, okay? It's the tasting straw. And I grab it like this and I go like this, and I pop it in and I taste. And every single time I'm making a cocktail, you're my guest, you're at my bar, you order a margarita or a Manhattan. It's the same recipe I've made 10,000 times. But I dip and I taste just to make sure. Um, I'm not looking to get drunk. That sixteenth of an ounce is not going to hurt me in any way. But what I'm doing is always affirming. But I'm also, it's quality control there. I'm making sure that something isn't off, that the, the, uh, the vermouth hasn't gone bad, or that perhaps the lime was too sour, too acidic, and I, do, I need to adjust. Or perhaps I didn't shake it as long, so there's not uh, enough dilution or enough air didn't get in there to open up the flavors, all of those things. So not only have I just tasted all the bottles and tasted a lime or a pineapple, but I've tasted these combinations hundreds of thousands of times. And so I understand the relationships. And uh, that's what I would advocate, is to always be tasting and thinking. Have that cognizance. I have one more if nobody Hit me. <laughs> um, so on the, again, going back to like the food movements mm -hmm. um, away from sugar in general, but particularly refined sugar, do you see a trend going that same direction? Because sugar is a very essential component of cocktails and balance. Mm. So talking about sweeteners, uh, I think that we've almost lost corn syrup in the bar world. Uh, there are certainly, there's mixers that still use it, but those mixers have just been downgraded so much that no one's interested. Uh, we also know how to make syrups on our own now. It's easy with fruit and sugar and water. So there's that. There's also, you know, 100% cane movement that's going on. Um, and then there's many different types of cane out there and process cane, whether you're talking about turbinado or finding molasses or using unbleached, you know, there's many different uh, things out there. And then you have alternate sugar sources, right? Uh, within the last dozen years, we've seen an explosion of agave nectar, right? Which, uh, as a sweetener, which does not give you much of a glycemic hit sort of more of a steady drip into your system, which also provides um, a nice sweetening viscosity in cocktails. Uh, specifically, it's popular now in margaritas, almost changing that classic margarita recipe, you know, from tequila, lime, and Cointreau to tequila, lime, and agave nectar. And that's pretty much the San Francisco margarita now. Very healthy in a lighter style. And then, of course, you got honey. Folks are, you know, cocktail bars now uh, across the country are lousy with honey. And I think that's a great thing. Uh, you make a honey syrup and then you employ that in. Um, and again, different sweeteners are coming about. Does that, uh, does that answer your question? I, th I think that's both healthier and it's also expanding flavor possibilities, both of which I think are important. Uh, so I guess about a year ago, I, I, for the first time, moved into an apartment that actually has room for a bar. So I've, I've Good for you. been developing. You got your Thank priorities you. right. I got my priorities right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So for the first time, now I have sort of a bar and I've, you know, I've got uh, 20 or 30 bottles or something, but I'm sort of wondering, how do you look about developing a home bar? What are the sort of things that you look for to expand it or the tools that you want? Or Great question. Expanding the home bar. What an important thing, right? Uh, you know, there's books out there. I think there's one that just came out called the 12 Bottle Bar. Mm -hmm. So perhaps buy that one. There's a lot of blogs out there on that. But essentially, I think you probably need to have um, one of each of the major spirit categories out there. But finding that bottle can be a difficult thing, OK? And say when you're judging your vodka, don't judge it by cracking it, pouring it neat, lukewarm in the glass, and then drinking it like that, because that's never how you're going to drink your vodka, right? Mm -hmm. So you want, it, you want to basically road test it. Uh, and that's one of the things that I share uh, in the book is that there wasn't one gin or whiskey or vodka or even tequila, etc., cetera, um, that I was always entirely satisfied. You would reach for one gin for a Negroni and then you'd reach for another one for, say, an aviation. What I started doing is creating blends. So as I have all of these different opportunities, and that's what I call them bottles. Call them opportunities behind me. I said, OK, I'm going to bring them together. So then I would create these master blends that I would keep in the speed route at the bar that would have four different types of gin in it. And then I would have this master cocktail spirit uh, based upon these blends and my, my years of experience of blending. And then, aha, every gin drink that I ever made was awesome. So um, if you want to do that, like if you're you know, a gin nerd, then buy the four bottles that I prescribe and make the blend and see if all of your gin cocktails turn out perfect. 
How would you characterize the art of bartending in this country today? Wow, the art of bartending today. You know, I'm going to actually say that um, the art has started to slip, and it's actually going into a realm where it's just craft and discipline. And, but and I think that that's okay. Um, I think that we got overwhelmed with art, and now there are so many options, so many bottles, as I've been talking about, so many things that m my concern. Mike, and how I'm answering this question is that I hope that mixologists are not staring into their navels, you know, more concerned by the three different types of bitters that are going into the cocktails and the hand carving of an ice for an old fashioned or, you know, where their local Meyer lemons are sourced, because that's really not what it's about. Uh, I think that cocktails should be artfully made, but ultimately, uh, I still hope that people go to bars to, you know, to get laid and to have a great time and to forget and to cope with gentrification and you know to wake up with a hangover in the morning and be proud um, and I hope that you know this cocktail renaissance does not screw all that up for us because cocktails should frankly still equal a great time and so in spite of all my pontificating and my seriousness about where uh, our palates uh, come from in this community, in this part of the world, uh, I still believe that, frankly, a cocktail needs to be a great time, uh, and hopefully it'll be a balanced one. Thank you. Mm -hmm.